welcome to the core volunteer training. It's a program created to help our support our volunteers, especially our newer volunteers and help you all connect with each other and the larger world to empower you to achieve the larger goals of climate advocacy. So this week's essential topic is understanding the basics of Congress and the legislative process. I'll be your host. My name is Sarah Wanis and I'm the membership coordinator here. We also have the amazing Morgan McHugh on the call today with us. Morgan, um, a little bit about her background. She started her journey at Citizens Climate Lobby as an intern under Amy Bennett in the fall of 2017, where she assisted with scheduling CCL's congressional lobby events. Morgan is currently positioned as the project coordinator in the Washington DC office where she works on various projects ranging from volunteer engagement and support um, to supplemental lobby trainings and membership data management. Through her role at CCL, she has been given the opportunity to combine her passion for climate change advocacy and her interest in bridging the gap between environmental science and policy issues. She's also currently pursuing her master's in environmental metrology and policy at Georgetown University in Washington, DC. So she's doing it right now from the West Coast remotely um, in California. And she also recently started a fellowship at NOAA as a Coastal Ocean Science and Policy Fellow. So Morgan is a great person to be talking to us about the legislative process. I wanna introduce you to our learning goals for today. After today, you should all be able to be aware of what a typical day of the congressional staff member looks like and to highlight some challenges and opportunities that elected officials face. You should understand the makeup of Congress and how to best engage with congressional staff in the legislative process. And we will touch on what that looks like during the time of a pandemic as well. And you should be prepared to use CCL's tools to be more engaged with your member of Congress. And to meet those learning goals, we'll move through this agenda. We'll talk about the membership and terminology, committees and chambers, the legislative process, life in Congress, where to find resources on community. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Morgan. Awesome, thank you, Sarah. I'm super excited to be able to represent the DC CCL team tonight and shed some light on how Congress works. So we'll get started. The term Congress member or congressman or congresswoman normally refers to a member of the House of Representatives, while a senator refers to senators. We use the term MOC often in CCL, um, as an acronym for member of Congress. Each chamber of Congress um, has an elected leader, as I'm sure you may know. In the House chamber, this person is known as the Speaker of the House of Representatives, and currently that's Nancy Pelosi. The Senate Majority Leader is Mitch McConnell. The Majority Leader customarily serves as the Chief Representative of their party in the Senate. Now let's get into where these MOCs work, which is in their committees and chambers. So U.S. Congress has two chambers, the Senate and the House of Representatives. Each state has two senators serving six-year terms. For the House, there's one representative from each district, which there are 435 districts, and they serve two-year terms. Number of representatives for a state is determined by the population. So as you can imagine, there are a lot of representatives in California or other densely populated states. So therefore, there are 535 members of US Congress in total. So Congress divides its tasks by legislative tasks, oversight tasks, and internal administrative tasks among approximately 200 committees and subcommittees. Your member of Congress may belong to several committees. This is where the work is done. There are different kinds of committees. There's standing, select, and joint. Standing committees are permanent panels, so they have legislative jurisdiction. Standing committees consider bills and issues and recommend measures for consideration by their respective chambers. Select committees are um, temporary ones, and they do things like conduct investigations or conduct studies. While joint committees are permanent, they focus on housekeeping tasks rather than considering legislative measures. So traditionally, when you think um, of a congressional committee, it's a standing committee. This one's permanent with legislative jurisdiction. It's not uncommon for a committee in the House or Senate with the same jurisdiction to go by a different name in a different chamber. So for example, the House Committee of Ways and Means is equivalent to the Senate Finance Committee. These committees decide which bills and res resolutions move forward for consideration by the House or Senate as a whole. 
and that's what's meant by a bill being in committee. One thing to note is that the biography CCL provides for each members of Congress, um, they highlight their current committees, and this is a valuable tool to understand the bills that fall within their jurisdiction. So stepping back from committees, let's take a look at some of the major differences between the House and the Senate. So in the Senate, the majority still holds a significant advantage when it comes to scheduling which bills come to the floor, but any single senator can stop legislation from moving forward on his or her own. While debate is limited in the House, debate in the Senate does not end until 60 senators vote for a cloture motion that moves consideration. If the majority does not currently bring to the table 60 votes on its own, it must work with the minority to set the rules for debate on important legislation. Often this means that major pieces of legislation can be debated for one or two weeks on the Senate floor. In the House, the majority party rules. The House conducts most of its important business by passing rules that determine the framework under which a bill will be debated. Since these rules only require a simple majority, the party with the most votes controls the debate. In most cases, rules limit debate so that major bills can be passed during one day of legislative business. So now we'll move on to the legislative process. So how a bill becomes a law. The following is a helpful look at the legislative process from the clerk of the House of Representatives. So bills can, be, um, can begin either in the House or Senate. There are instances when different versions of a bill can begin in both chambers concurrently. Bills can only be introduced by members of Congress. Many bills originate in the executive branch and then are introduced by a congressional sponsor. And other members can join as co-sponsors. Once introduced, new bills are numbered and sent to the appropriate committee by the Speaker of the House or the presiding officer in the Senate. We'll move on to committee action. Um, this is gonna be a slide after and then we'll come back to this um, larger dynamic afterwards. So the bill comes under its most intense scrutiny while in committee and many bills die in committee. The bill is considered either by the full committee or a subcommittee, and many bills um, may be referred to more than one committee. A bill can be referred to a committee over one line in the legislative text. So for H.R. 763, it is substantially under the jurisdiction of Ways and Means, followed by Energy and Commerce. It's actually only one small subsection of the bill that refers H.R. 763 to the Foreign Affairs Committee. The Speaker of the House may set time limits on committees, um, and failure to act on a bill is equivalent to killing it. So hearings may also be held, and a hearing is an official meeting or a session of a Senate, House, Joint, or Special Committee of Congress, and it's usually open to the public to obtain information and opinions on proposed legislation. Committees only study and amend the sections of the bill that they have jurisdiction over. So a committee will hold a markup session during which it will make revisions and additions. If substantial amendments are made, the committee can order the introduction of a clean bill, which will include the proposed amendments. This new bill will have a new number and will be sent to the floor while the old bill is discarded. The chamber must approve, change, or reject all committee amendments before a final passage vote. A bill must pass through every committee it is referred to. So after the hearings and the study to mark up the bill, the full committee votes on a recommendation to the House or the Senate. Then once a bill passes through all committees of jurisdiction, the rules committee decides the rules for debate and amendments and when the bill will come up for debate on the House floor. So now we'll get into the floor action. So um, next the bill appears before either the House or the Senate. The two chambers have different procedures for floor debate. So in the House, the House Rules Committee regulates debate for each bill, issuing the rule for the bill. Members can speak on a bill for a set period of time as specified in the rule. To speed debate on some rules, on some bills, the House meets as the Committee of the Whole, which has different rules for floor debate. So the Committee of the Whole can amend a bill, but they can't pass it. A discharge petition signed by majority of the House membership, so 218 members, can be used to force the bill, um, the release of a bill from a committee. In the Senate, Senate debate is unlimited. Senators may speak at any length on any topic, and any senator can stop a debate with a filibuster. Debate can be closed by unanimous consent or by invoking cloture, which requires a three-fifths majority, so at least 60 votes of the entire Senate. 
once one chamber has passed, has voted to pass a bill, the other chamber may pass it with the language intact, refer it to a committee for scrutiny or alteration, reject the bill, informing the other chamber of its actions, or ignore the bill while continuing to work on its own version of the legislation. When the two chambers pass differing versions of legislation, the bill goes to conference committee, and this is the third of Congress. Members from of the House and Senate committees that worked on the bill then meet together um, to work out a compromise. Members are not allowed to write new legislation. They must work within the boundaries of the differences in the House and Senate bills. When the conferees have reached an agreement, they submit a report of recommendations to each chamber for approval. So the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate both sign the approved bill and then they send it to the President, who then has four options. If the President signs and dates the bill, it becomes law. If Congress is in session and the President does not sign the bill within 10 days, the bill becomes law without his signature. The President may veto the entire bill this means the bill goes back to Congress for a second vote in which it must get two thirds majority of votes in each chamber in order to become law. If Congress adjourns within 10 days of giving the bill to the president and he does not sign the bill, then the bill dies. And this is called a pocket veto. So as we've just learned, the bill has to pass through these three committees before it can go to the House floor. So the more co-sponsors we get on these committees, the better. Currently, we have six members on the Ways and Means Committee. We have six members on Energy and Commerce and 15 members on Foreign Affairs um, that are also co-sponsors on our bill. So getting those numbers higher with, um, will make a huge difference in passing HR 763 through committees. And if you're looking for more depth, Politico has a wonderful guide with simplified infographics to the legislation process in both the House and the Senate. And then you can also brush up on congressional terminology or schoolhouse rock with these um, links as well that I'll put in the chat. All right, so moving on, each member of Congress has at least two offices. So one in the state or district and a legislative office, which is um, in DC. If the member of Congress represents a large state or a district, they may have more than one local office. Each has their own budget. So the House has about $1.4 million per year and the Senate varies. And most of that goes to staff with House offices limited to 18 full-time and four part-time, while the Senate office has no limits on staff. Just like a normal business, they hire staff, they purchase the equipment and furniture, they find office space, and they provide services to their customers or their constituents. So now we'll move on um, to Bradford Fitch's Citizens Handbook to Influencing Elected Officials. And we're gonna go over the roles of legislative staff who you may meet during your lobby meetings or have already met. So the first we'll talk about is the chief of staff. So this is the head honcho in any congressional office. This person is usually the closest advisor to the legislator and perhaps a long time personal friend. They run operation much like a chief operations officer. Then we have the legislative director. The staffer is called the LD and they are the senior policy staffer in the office. This person likely has been with the office for more than three or four years, promoted from legislative assistant and they oversee all major policy decisions. They likely oversee and edit all newsletters and emails, staffers, and they have jurisdiction over issues most important to the legislator or the most prominent issues as determined by the legislator's committee assignments. Then we have the legislative assistant. So this staffer is called an LA and they are the primary author expert on a particular issue. So here are he statements in speeches, writes memos on legislation and advises the legislator on the issues in their jurisdiction. In the house, LAs can have up to 15 issues to follow. The jurisdiction of Senate LAs ranges from one to 10 issues, depending upon the size of the office. House LAs tend to be younger, so under 30, while in the Senate, they tend to be older and have graduate degrees. Legislative staff are both research assistants and policy advisors to members of Congress. They research the facts of an issue, collect the positions of interested parties, analyze the implications to constituents, and synthesize the information for legislators. So legislative assistants, known as LAs, they also interject recommendations on policy decisions on almost every issue in their portfolio and research memos. They become policy experts no matter how limited their experience is with the issue and they do influence legislators. When approaching the legislator, they will always consult this 
staff expert on the um, topic and they usually follow the recommendation of the staff. So this doesn't mean that the staff control all decision making they do because they do not at all. Rather, it means that staff are usually in tune with the thinking of their bosses and guide them to a decision they assume the legislator desires. So these relationships are really important. Legislative correspondent is next. This is called ELSI, and they are primarily responsible for managing and drafting responses to mail. So typically they are very young, under 25, and they have less than two years of experience on the Hill. They toil at this thankless job sorting thousands of emails, faxes, postcards, and letters each month with the hope that they'll get promoted after one of the LAs finds another job. If you meet with the legislative correspondent, it means it's a very busy day and the LA with jurisdiction probably had a scheduling conflict. Then we have a staff assistant. So this staffer primarily handles phone calls to the office and greets visitors. Why is legislators hire someone from the district or state for this job? So that callers feel an instant connection. Then lastly, we have the scheduler. So this staffer may also um, share the title of an office manager and is responsible for the legislator's schedule. Some lawmakers have two schedulers, one in DC and another in the state or district. The scheduler is the ultimate gatekeeper and it may be the person who determines whether you and your group meets with the legislator. Try not to be disappointed though if you don't get to meet with a member of Congress or a specific policy aide. Not meeting with the pertinent staff member is not necessarily a slight. They're very busy people. So if it happens again and again, then it might be something to start um, taking a look at. All right, so now Sarah is going to give us a look into what it's like working with Congress or in Congress. Yes, so we wanted to give you a little window into what the life of working in Congress looks like. So here's what it looks like to work as a staffer on Capitol Hill. Staffers on Capitol, on Capitol Hill work long hours in fast paced and cramped conditions. The number of staff that a House member is allotted by law has not changed since the 70s, despite the fact that the workload and expectation to produce has grown exponentially. Each office has receives anywhere between a 200 and a 1000% increase in constituent mail in the past decade alone. So I'll say that again so it can sink in. In the past decade alone, with no staff increases, they received anywhere from a 200 to a 1000% increase in constituent mail. That means that they're receiving 6,000 to 25,000 emails in a week, um, which is a lot for their staff to go through. Nevertheless, when surveyed, 87% of members of Congress say that email has made it easier to become, invo to become involved. Three, uh, or one out of three say it, said it's made representatives and senators more accountable, um, but only 41% say it's increased constituents' understanding of DC. Um, which plays and that constituents play a vital role. And these folks are pretty young. The average age of a legislative assistant is just 27 years old. So imagine what it's like when we call an email with all of these, um, with so many requests. And according to the Congressional Management Foundation, here are a few key insights on what it's like for members of Congress, um, as a member of Congress working. Um, a member of Congress works 70 hours a week when in session and an average of 49 hours a week when they are out of session. They have about 13 meetings every single day. Um, and they spend 78% or more of their weekends in district every year, which means they're traveling back and forth between DC and their district. 35% of their total time spent as a member of Congress is on legislation. So meeting with their colleagues and in committee meetings, and the rest of the time is approximately 32% spent at home, um, working with um, congressional services, and the set remaining 17 to 18% is um, campaigning. Uh, the number of staff is 18 full-time staff, which is the limit set by law in 1974, so they cannot have more than uh, 18 full-time staff. Um, in House, that average is about nine staff in DC and seven in the district. And in the Senate, they're allowed to have a few more. They on average have 22 in the uh, 22 in the state and 13 in the district. And now we did want to address what it's like working with Congress during the COVID the, during the time of COVID-19 as well. So a global pandemic has certainly amplified a lot of the stressors in all of our lives, and members of Congress and their staff are not immune to this. 
Members of Congress are certainly spending most of their time or all of their time trying to support their, their constituents through the public health and economic crises that have been caused by COVID-19. But we know that the climate crisis has not stopped in the face of this crisis, so we wanted to talk about um, what our strategy to handling that while recognizing what a member of Congress's job might look like. Speaking to members of Congress about climate change during this time does not need to stop completely, but it will look different. You should definitely be working with your local liaison or group leader to think about the best strategy for working with your specific representative in Congress. It's their job to, it's the group leaders and liaisons job to manage our relationships with these offices. So they will be able to advise you on how much bandwidth your member of Congress does or doesn't have for climate at this time, and we should be respectful of that. These differences in bandwidth will vary on a lot of things, including the um, extent of the crises in their district, their committee memberships, their areas of expertise, and more. So it's hard to make a blanket statement about how COVID has, expect, has affected members of Congress at this time. But um, it is easy to say that in a blanket statement that there is never a bad time for appreciation. You can certainly use this time to appreciate your member of Congress for shared values that they might be showing in their work on COVID-19 and the associated crises. It's also generally um, all right to briefly let them know that you are still concerned about climate change as an overarching issue during this crisis, so they know that there is still interest in, this dis in their district. If your member of Congress has a bit more bandwidth to discuss climate change more deeply, we do have some messaging points for speaking about climate change in a COVID world. You can find all of our messaging on community. I just dropped a link in the chat for you to find all of that, but here are some of the key points. So first of all, COVID comes first. It would be a bit tone deaf for us to enter a conversation right now without it at first mentioning or checking in on them um, and asking how things are going with the COVID crisis in their district. We want to stress that climate is still a critical problem that we need to address, even as this issue may be taking up more of their time. And that the pandemic has disrupted our personal lives and our global economy and climate change will also disrupt our lives and on a massive scale as well. We also like to emphasize that if we act as soon as possible, that solving climate change can be made more a moderate, a more moderate transition rather than acute, an acute crisis. The fifth talking point is that we can have a healthy economy and our modern lives um, and, and solve climate change all at the same time. Um, and it goes on. So you can read all the rest of those and some other points about what CCL has to offer during this time. So the most important thing that you can do um, to keep the ball rolling in Congress is to keep building support. We want to, well, um, we want to get to the point where the House feels like they are ready to move forward on climate solutions. And it's clear that the Energy Innovation Act is the bill with the most support from Democrats and Republicans alike. So you all know how to do this by pulling all those five levers of political will. And it's also important to always remember how hectic life is for a member of Congress and their staff and how that might even be a little bit more hectic now. While we might be getting frustrated that the legislative process is moving slowly, um, it's important to know that these staffers and members of Congress are working on a million different issues and moving a bunch of different bills. So we should always be gracious and um, to any time spent talking with us and talking about our bill. The best thing that we can do to make it easy to, is make it easy for them to support our bill. That means garnering support in the district through endorsements, letters to the editor, constituent letters, et cetera. But it also means being an easy and enjoyable person for that office to work with. We do have some more um, resources on Congress to share with you from the Congressional Management Foundation. And you can find these on the re on community under the resources tab by searching or by searching Congressional Management Foundation. The mission of the Congressional Management Foundation is to help citizens work best with their members of Congress. In their mission, it says, citizen trust is an effective and um, in, an, in an effective and responsive Congress is essential to democracy. The Congressional Management Foundation advances this goal by working directly with members of Congress and staff to enhance operations and interactions with constituents. The CMF works directly with citizen groups to educate them on how Congress works, giving constituents a stronger voice in, po in policy outcomes. The results are a Congress that is more accountable, transparent, and effective, and an informed citizenry with greater trust in democratic institutions. 
and CMF uh, accomplishes this, uh, and CMF accomplishes a lot of great goals along this area, similar goals to what we would like to work on. They enhance the effectiveness of congressional offices by enabling them to provide better services for their constituents and create better policy outcomes for all Americans. They promote transparency and accountability in Congress, affording citizens data and tools to help them become more informed about decisions that affect them and their families and their communities. They also educate and motivate individuals to become active and informed citizen advocates, providing them with an understanding of Congress and the skills to influence public policy. And last but not least, they enhance the, public understand, the public's understanding of how Congress really works to provide a window into our democratic institutions. We wanted to highlight some of the most important findings of the Congressional Management Foundation, um, as shared with CCL in our prior More Perfect Union partnership. All of the details here are available on this public page that I am dropping in the chat. But here's what they found. They found that direct constituent interactions have more influence on lawmakers' decisions than other advocacy strategies. So in three surveys of congressional staff over a 10-year span, they found that 99% in 2004, 97% in 2010, and 94% in 2015 said that in-person visits from constituents would have a lot or some um, influence on an undecided lawmaker. So it's really great that we are making these connections. They also found that Congress places a high value on groups and citizens who have built relationships with legislators and staff, which is exactly what we are working to do. They found that when advocacy groups should um, do, uh, do more of this relationship building in the office, 79% of staff said that they that people should meet or get to know the legislative assistant um, in the jurisdiction over their issue area. And 62% said that people should meet or get to know the district or state director. They also found that citizen advocates are more influential and contribute to better pol public policy when they provide personalized and local information to Congress. Nine out of 10 or 91% of congressional staffers surveyed said that it would be helpful to have information about the impact of the bill or issue on the district or state. However, only 9% report that they actually receive that information frequently. So it's important for us to fill that gap and provide that information about how our bill and, the, and climate change will locally affect your districts and states. Similarly, 79% um, said that a personal story from a constituent related to a bill or issue would be helpful but only 18% said that they received that frequently. So keep telling those personal stories. And the last bullet point highlighted here is that they found that citizens have um, significant potential to enhance their advocacy skills and influence Congress. After concluding 40 hours of CMF and Feeding America advanced advocacy training over four months, citizen advocates from local food banks met with their members of Congress and staff. Whereas 12% of congressional staff report the typical constituent that they meet with is very prepared, 97% of the staff who met with the advocacy trainees agreed that the citizen advocates were very prepared. So thank you for doing the preparation like you are doing right now by attending this meeting and making sure you are educated and ready to meet with the member of Congress. We are gonna have to go ahead and wrap up here, but I just dropped a link in the chat to the forums on community. If you have any questions that we didn't get to, I was reading through some of them. These are all really great questions. And I know for a fact that some of them are already answered in the forums there. So if you go search some of your key um, um, points in the forums, you can likely find a thread where volunteers are discussing that and you can jump in with any additional questions or you can start a new thread to get any of your questions answered. Um, we have a lot of really knowledgeable volunteers who help answer those questions and our staff also help answer those so um, we can get any questions that you have answered there thank you all so much and have a great rest of your evening thank you thank you thank you thank you for listening to this episode of citizens climate lobby's training program you can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available inspired by what you heard today join citizens climate lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. And together, 
We are creating the political will for a livable world.